Hi, everybody. How are you? <laughs> my team is here. It's for everyone that's on Zoom. My team is here, and they made hell yeah shirts. So uh, can someone come up here? Can we bring one up and put them on the camera real quick? Just to, just to, yeah. when, you, when you guys come up real quick, just so everyone knows what the heck I'm laughing at. <laughs> this is why Zach had like three extra bags of luggage. <laughs> You jerks. Did you make me one? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> All right, shoot now. I got to talk. Thank you, guys. That's so funny. All right, Joe Helly. Uh, I'm the mayor online, if you've uh, heard about me before. And today we're going to talk about how I was born many nights now. Uh, and I found a bunch of CVEs. Uh, but it started one night uh, just trying to hack the hiring process. I'm an Iraq and Afghanistan Army veteran, uh, again, known as the mayor. I got a bunch of certifications you may or may not have heard about. Uh, and I'm a huge advocate for trying to change uh, the break-in process for cybersecurity, uh, especially on the offensive side, uh, but also advocating for some of the more entry-level jobs, talking about help desk, talking about stock analysts, et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, but not having experience with, with those positions that is limited. Uh, and you know, my first profession in IT was as a penetration tester, and it was because of uh, continued challenges and struggles with trying to break in. I didn't have the help desk position, so I didn't have the experience, but I couldn't get the experience to get the position, right? So specifically for you know cybersecurity and for offensive security, again, we look at that industry and a lot of people think, maybe correctly or incorrectly, that it's a, more of a mid to end career position. You've got to work your way up that totem pole, you know, starting off grinding, you know, you're pulling cable, you're trying to, uh, you know, file tickets and, and re you know, respond to tickets and fix printers and move up to the SOC analyst and then move up to a senior SOC analyst before you start thinking about uh, trying to break into the attack surface and starting to, you know, look at the offensive side of the house rather than the defensive. I think that also we have issues with certifications and the more people gain certifications, it starts to diminish those values. It's just simple um, economics. So the more you have of something, the less valuable it is. Uh, and as for instance, as more people gain the OSCP, uh, the less that stands out and the more it becomes a resume bullet, kind of like an associate's degree 10 years ago, kind of like a bachelor's degree now. A lot of people have them because they're told they need to get them now versus using it to stand out. Uh, same thing goes for uh, GitHub uh, blogs, things like that. Back in the day, those were really important. Every, you know, People who wanted to stand out had them. They were well visited and they had lots of traffic. Uh, but as more people got the uh, kind of the advice to start a blog, you know, start, uh, you know, a Twitter page, start a LinkedIn, the value diminishes because now you're in this huge pool of people trying to do the same thing. One thing that stands out, though, is CVEs, right? So no matter where you're at, if you're brand new coming into the industry, you're getting your A plus, you're working on your core one, or you're a vice president of security operations, this is something that everyone knows what it is. You're taught from a very early stand, you know, very early point. Uh, whether you're doing CompTIA, ISC squared, or something, that CVEs are uh, zero days. They're vulnerabilities that have been found in software applications, in code, uh, in mobile apps. And again, it's something that everyone understands. And it's something that a lot of people don't understand as well for the process of getting them. So it can be a really daunting task, but anytime you're talking to somebody, you say, I've got a CVE, their ears are gonna raise. You know, they're gonna say, what the heck, you know, what'd you do? And it doesn't matter what you did. It could be as simple as finding a cross-site scripting vulnerability or uh, the latest and greatest Microsoft uh, attack that takes down uh, entire nation states. It doesn't matter what it is. Uh, you've put due diligence forward and you've gone through and found something that no one else has or that no one else has reported before. And being able to do that to stand out and show yourself off is huge. And many people will go through their entire careers without ever finding one. Some people will look for them for years and not be able to find one. And maybe they don't know how you know, what they're looking for. So we're gonna talk about that. Um, again, we talked here a little bit. Uh, size doesn't matter. Again, zero days, show a person's initiative. It says somebody went out and they researched. They were able to uh, research effectively. They're able to understand methodology. If you're looking for web app CVs, you're looking at, say, a WordPress plugin. You're able to work through, say, the OWASP uh, website testing guide and to go through that methodology and to look for those vulnerabilities and then know how to actually exploit them. Uh, from there, you understand client communications, which when we go through the hiring process, that's huge for us, soft skills. And that's not something that's touched on a lot when you're looking at submitting uh, you know, a report for like e-learn security exams or offensive security exams, or you're just submitting a report, you set it and forget it like a Ronco, 
Anybody old enough to remember a Ronco here? <laughs> so you're submitting those things, but really you don't get much value other than writing up a report as fast as you can while you're half asleep. But this, you're communicating with clients. You're doing the reporting. You're going back and forth negotiating with somebody who may not understand security, somebody who may be taking this attack very personal because this is a project of, you know, it's a labor of love for them. Uh, or you may go, be going again against, say, Microsoft. You might be finding a vulnerability in AWS. You're working with uh, people who oversee tens of thousands of people plus, uh, you know, worldwide security apparatus, and you're discussing these things with them. You don't get this in the certification realm. You don't get this by submitting your reports. And this makes you stand out because you've got that experience and it's quantifiable. Uh, this again was born just kind of being bored. Again, I've, my boss is here and he's the first person who gave me a, cho a chance here. Uh, but trying to break in is next to impossible, especially for pen testing. Uh, so I've mentored people and I was mentoring people before anyone would hire me, uh, which was crazy, right? So I was mentoring people and trying to find ways once I was hired to help them break in themselves. Prop the door open once you're in, right? It's something that a lot of people don't think about. They get in and then they never look back. So I've been thinking about how to prop that door open and help people crack the code. And this was one of those things. So I just started looking for open source projects online and trying to figure out exactly what I could do. So finding potential targets, it's a little bit of Google foo here. So for this instance, just Hotel CMS FOSS. You could do Hotel CMS GitHub. Just think about an industry that you've worked in. Think about an industry you know would have security vulnerabilities. Look for things that may be a mom and pop project. And they're all open game. They're all something you can contact with. But in this case, I just look for this and you know, there's links that'll pop up. It'll tell you, you know, the top four. There'll be lists on GitHub telling you about PHP projects up the wazoo or Ruby projects. Uh, and so do the research, find the projects. Uh, and then in this case, this one got me a ton uh, of results. Some of them are paywalled. You're looking at, you know, payware uh, software. Some of them were impossible for me, somebody without systems administrator experience to install. So if you have that, you know, if you're like me, look for projects that you can install. Look for Docker containers. Uh, look for something you can run in WSL. Look at, you know, something that comes in a VM. You know, do what you can to try to learn the process. Take notes on how you're doing it. Uh, but figure it out and stay within your realm. If you don't know how to, you know, go through 81 steps on your own or figure out how to set up an Apache web server, you do the research or move on. There's plenty of projects you can do here. Uh, and then again, hitting that one. So I settled on Hotel Druid with the first one. Downloadable applications were the easiest. So in this case, it was just a simple desktop app, but they've got a GitHub app as well. Uh, some of them have licensing, you know, here in the United States. Uh, thank goodness the Department of Justice has kind of gotten on board with uh, safe harboring with testing and making sure that you're protected as long as you're goodwill testing, right? But do be cognizant that you're not always going to test an application where the developer's happy about it. They may take it very personally. They may not understand that this is okay, that it's on your computer, that you can test it. You don't want to probe at their infrastructure, but when it's within your house, it's more or less okay. So testing is the easiest part in this case. You find the application, you've done the research, you've installed it. Figuring out how to test it now uh, is where you build that methodology portion of your skill base, right? Being able to show what you can do. So uh, in this case, you can use uh, Burp Suite, Burp Suite Pro. I like OWASP Zap for this stuff, uh, more so because I can show people that there's a free product out there similar to Burp Suite Pro uh, that's well-maintained, well-developed, and it's a good project all in all. And I want people to understand you don't just have to rely on the big ticket priced items. You don't have to spend 400 bucks a year. You don't have to you know, go get NetSparker or something to be good at this. You can use what's on your Kali distro. You can use what you can install on Windows. Uh, and then um, I used Burp Suite Pro for the first one because I had it. And then I went back and used Zap later just to show that I could. Uh, and again, started testing. So in less than an hour, I'd found reflected cross-site scripting and a boatload of SQL injections. In this case, they were using SQLite. So if you don't have a lot of experience with say, you know, if you do a lot of MySQL uh, cross or SQL injection, if you're doing labs, it's pretty common. Uh, but in this case, you gotta learn some uh, SQLite. So you're starting to kind of cross the, the database boundary to figure out what else you're testing. And then you found your vulnerabilities, you've made your notes, and now you need to apply for it. This is where a lot of people stop. They found the vulnerability, but they have no idea what to do with it, right? And this can feel daunting because the resources, at least when I'm starting to do it, and uh, Phil Wiley's here, and uh, he's used some of my, uh, I've got a Medium article uh, that writes out this very, very clearly for folks because it is daunting. And I had to go out and essentially research this myself to understand how to do it. Um, so what you're looking for when you're looking at projects, uh, first and foremost, to see if they're a CNA, which is Certified Numbering Authority. Uh, and 
all that really means is if you look at a company like Microsoft, and then if you look at, say, Joe's GitHub, Microsoft is a certified numbering authority. When you want to file a vulnerability or report a vulnerability, you need to do it through their processes. You need to do it through their security team. And then they get to choose whether it's vulnerable, you know, whether it's vulnerable, whether they're going to issue the CV or not. Versus, say, you know, small mom and pop shop, they've got a thousand stars on their project on GitHub, uh, and you're working back and forth, but they aren't a CNA. You can file directly through uh, MITRE through this process. Now, it's been updated a little bit in the last 12 months, so this is maybe a little out of date, but it should more or less be uh, the same premises. So for this vendor, uh, you want, and for all vendors, you want to give them uh, the respect of notifying them first that their application is vulnerable. You don't want to just start dumping zero days online and vulnerabilities without them first knowing, having the chance to talk about it to see if it's actually an issue, and to be able to patch it, right? You don't want them just having their, their software out there vulnerable for everyone to see. So you want to contact them. Uh, and then once you've contacted them, uh, you go through the MITRE process, which again can be somewhat daunting. We got some screenshots here. The request type is just a CVE, you put your email in. You can have multiple vulnerabilities here. So if you say find 12 reflected cross-site scripting vulnerabilities in one application, uh, you could include 12. Uh, and then you just have to make sure that you verify that they're not a CNA. Again, we talked about that because if they are a CNA, you need to report through them. Uh, and then you verify that it's uh, not already been found. You know, that's the biggest part. So you describe the vulnerability type, the product vendor, their name, uh, and then the version. Uh, and then you just give a, a basic understanding or explanation of what it is. And this is what's going to be used in the CV, in the notice when it's released on MITRE. So when you go and you look at these uh, NIST updates and you see a new CV, this is where that information is coming from, uh, from the person who found it. So you just fill this in the best you can. You're not always going to know. One thing of note here with the Discover, MITRE does not attribute findings to a person. So we're going to talk about then right here, you need to make sure you take ownership of your finding. So uh, in this case, you'll see here additional information. They need a reference in order for you to be issued an ID uh, and for it to be made public. So uh, you see here, I'm just saying, we'll provide the GitHub link uh, once an ID is issued. It's just a simple email back and forth with MITRE. It's super simple to do. Uh, and this is what it looks like when your, your notice comes in, right? They give you a reservation. They tell you your CVE number. Uh, and then please provide the valid references. You just do it on GitHub, right? As soon as you're done with the disclosure process with the vendor, uh, you know, that maintains the project, uh, you make that public, you let uh, MITRE know, and they update it and they release the CV to the public. Uh, again, we've just got a couple here on GitHub that I've released there. Uh, they make the notice public. It takes a little bit. It can take a few hours. It can take several weeks, depending on how MITRE is backed up. Uh, and then you'll see the awaited analysis. That's coming from NIST when they do their vulnerability scoring. And then again, that application is one way, but something has come along in the last few years called Hunter.dev. Has anyone heard of Hunter before? Hunter, he has because he's been doing what I do. So Hunter.dev is a CNA for any project on GitHub. So basically it's a bug bounty program uh, for GitHub repositories. Now I'm not a representative of them, but I do believe in what they're doing because this is a really awesome way to both get into bug bounty and get into CV hunting because they are a CNA. So they'll work with you and the uh, repo owner, the, uh, the maintainer, to file for these findings. And you just go through a similar submission form. So here I found a vulnerability uh, in Zamad, which is a help desk support system. Uh, I found a vulnerability in something called Rack Attack. So if there's any Rails developers out here, uh, make sure that your Rack Attack is configured appropriately because I found like six of these. And, and basically in this project, all that's happening is uh, you're able to bypass 429 protections by appending random strings to the end of API endpoints. So say backslash login is the protected endpoint. If that's not defined specifically, or if it is defined specifically uh, as like a contained statement, then you can bypass it, right? So I found a way and I just went out hunting Rails projects online and found a bunch of these. So you just file through here, it's similar. You, you apply for the CVSS score on your own. You give them a write-up title, uh, the description, uh, the impact, uh, and then this part, the occurrences, is something that's interesting and really takes you outside your comfort zone if you're not done development. You need to go into their code and try to find the vulnerability and let that developer know what they need to identify and try to fix. Now, you can put in here, I have no idea what I'm talking about. I just think this is where it's at. And go through the code and try to find where that occurrence is. Or if you are a Rails developer and you found these, be good. Show them exactly what's going on. Well, after leveraging or after receiving your CVs, it's time to leverage them, right? Um, so uh, again, I wrote some articles uh, and posted some things on LinkedIn. Uh, here we got a couple more added to my fine collection uh, here recently. Literally like one of the first threaded race conditions found uh, with a Python library uh, and then a rack attack. But then hearing people talk about 
uh, how you've helped them, right? So uh, again, these are just a couple things. This is how I've leveraged it on like my, uh, my uh, resume and then my LinkedIn. But over here, people telling me, hey, we got interviews because of this, right? It does work. Uh, you just have to figure out how to do it. And hopefully, uh, a lot of you probably aren't at the stage where you're trying to break in, but you know people who are. So please take this back home. Please help that next person break in uh, and start getting some of these messages, right? It feels so good to hear that you helped somebody get a job uh, because they found a CV because you taught them how. And, and it's huge. And it's something that, again, is identifiable. Uh, it's harrowing to get into here. And it makes you seen. And in the end, when you're trying to break in nowadays, you just need to be seen. So Joe Helley on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn there as well, my GitHub. This is the Medium uh, page. If you want to check out that article that I wrote, it's uh, medium.themayor.tech. And then if you want to check out my website as well, I've got all my notes on there that I uh, disclose to the public in you know, Active Directory, Windows, et cetera. So um, that's all. Does anybody have any questions? Hey. hey is there any, so say you contact the developer first. Right? Sure. And then they're like, oh, okay, like, and then they fix it immediately. Does that basically torpedo your ability to get the CV? If you're doing it through Hunter, and they're, if they're responding with you through Hunter, uh, and the, you know, you can get the admins involved and say, hey, look, they put a fix in already. And then they'll just retroactively on Hunter issue that finding for you. Plus, you may make a few bucks. You know, I've got a bounty waiting through a really large uh, CMS platform that's uh, just back and forth right now working with them to get it released. But there's people on there. You can go through some of the hack. It's called Hacktivity, but previous findings to see that people have reported that exact thing. Hey, I checked back on their GitHub and they fixed it already. Uh, the admins are happy to work with you to to get that remedied on their end because they are the CNA, so they can issue that. Uh, and then to get the finding disclosed and get you paid. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. No, I don't. Uh, and there's a reason why. It's because security is a worldwide thing. And whether they're supportive of the disclosure or they're not, people are using that software. And I think it's even more important to make sure that people understand that software is vulnerable. Not everyone is security minded. You know, you've got developer boot camps coming out where they're just churning out people understanding Java or Rails, and they're not teaching secure, you know, coding design and, and you know, secure development, and they don't want to work with you. Again, you've done your due diligence, you've contacted the vendor, you've tried to give them the respect. You, you don't need their permission or approval to file through MITRE. MITRE will just simply have a checkbox that says, have you contacted me? You don't have to, you know, it's respectful to. But as for repercussions, no. I mean, you see all the time with Microsoft, uh, they'll say something's not vulnerable, and then you see Curb Relay up two days later, nuking environments. What's the repercussion, right? You know, Microsoft doesn't think it's a vulnerability, so we'll take over half your network because of it. So, any other questions? Yeah, sure. Do, probably time for like one more, I'm guessing. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, I guess what criteria would you advise someone to choose Hunter versus just going to Miter? Like what, what, how do you make that distinction on which one to go with? Is it based on? Yeah, sure. Um, I think if you're looking for projects that are in GitHub, it would be foolish not to go through the Hunter process because they're managing the client, the initial communication. They're sending the notifications out. If the repo doesn't have the security policy set up, the first thing they're saying is we have a security vulnerability. Will you please set up a security policy so that we can communicate with you? That's dual, you know, that's helping both that repo begin the first steps of securing their project simply by having, hey, that's who you contact. You know, that's half the problem with these things is you end up having to file through the issues first to try to get a hold of somebody because there is no security contact. Um, if you're doing GitHub projects, Hunter is the way to go because again, they're the CNA. You don't have to file for anything. They do it all on their end. And it's literally just a checkbox for them. You know, it's all automated. So uh, before this platform was available, then yeah, I mean, you're on your own. So um, that's all we have. Thank you guys so much and uh, the team for showing up. Thanks.